story may blow your mind slightly. Um, I'm kind of in a unique position. I, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I have a background in like web design, uh, marketing, graphic design, um, those types of things. And I, years ago, my brother, well, years ago I got a friend that he uh, does tons of game stuff. He's building a compiler and all those fancy things. Um, and he told me about Unity. And at the time, it cost a whole bunch of money, like a thousand dollars, I think, something uh, expensive. So I thought, well, it's not really an option for me. Um, later, he, my brother was taking a class uh, in his college, and he's telling me he's using Unity, and it was free. So I thought that was pretty exciting. So I went online, and what this was like, maybe 2015, it was released for free. Um, the personal edition. You can also do the paid version with other, get other features. Um, but uh, so I downloaded Unity, and with no, well, I used Game Guru for about five minutes, maybe maybe a week or two, um, and I I uh, I started using Unity. Uh, and I just had this idea that I just wanted to build a game, build build cool stuff, build fun things, build things. Uh, so I started building a game. Um, I had this whole idea I was going to build this thing, and it was going to be amazing. And uh, I basically I broke every so many errors, like ten thousand errors, like a million errors. I tried to download some things into my game, and I broke the whole thing. And I had no idea what I was doing um, at the beginning. So I thought, you know what, let's learn from this. Let's start another game. Well, let's start a real game this time. Uh, something I thought was a game. And let's call it Ruction the Golden Tower. So this was the first time, so I had no prior game building experience. And you're probably wondering, well, how the heck, how the heck do you do that with no, no prior experience? Um, that's why I say, uh, my story's probably a little unique. I put in quite a bit of time at the beginning and throughout the whole process, probably more time than most people want to do anything, <laughs> not just building games. Um, so I, I uh, built this game, Ruction the Golden Tablet, and I'll go through what the game is and how I went about it. And I released it on Steam um, just last year and sold all over the world. So uh, I'm not technically allowed to tell you how many I sold. Steam agreements, but just know that it's sold all over the place. Um, and it's no AAA title, but I built it all myself. Um, it's got some good features, we'll just say that. I think they're good. But there's a lot of work to be done still. I released it uh, early access, and uh, do I have plans to finish it? I did, <laughs> but after I realized, you'll see, there's, it's, it's very expansive and comprehensive. Um, so Ruction, the Golden Tablet, is a 3D open world adventure game where you embark on a journey through a jungle environment, <laughs> um, looking for clues that lead to your lost brother, and along the way discover the mystery of the Golden Tablet. All right, so there's about maybe 20. I personally finished the game in about five hours, um, going straight through, not doing anything. Uh, and this is a screenshot, one of the screenshots of the game. But there's about 20 for most people, 20 to 30 hours, maybe less, maybe more, uh, depending on who you are and what your prior experience is. Most of the game uh, is ex exploration and questing. So imagine um, Skyrim or World of Warcraft, but you don't fight anyone. You basically go around, talk to people, um, experience the world, uh, interact with NPCs. Um, a lot of the game is dialogue based. You go and uh, you interact with the NPC, you talk to them, go collect items, uh, look for treasures, climb up things. Um, so there's there's about 50 or so objectives um, that you accomplish. You know, like I said, collecting things mostly. Uh, it's it's a it's a very simple uh, layout structure, like in, as in design. Um, 
and I built this all myself, so there's there's quite a bit involved. Um, I've got a YouTube channel that I used to post random game stuff on, and then I used that to push out my game. Probably about 200 or so thousand people um, saw the game, saw the videos. I posted on things like IndieDB, which basically was worthless uh, as far as exposure. Um, which, by the way, so I did use Unity, of course, which is why we're here, and I love Unity, by the way. It's like so awesome. Uh, and I, I've used other stuff, but Unity seems to be the all around like Photoshop version of game building. Although I've never used any other game builder, so maybe it's a little biased, but I never had any real problems using Unity, regardless of what I've read online, which has been quite a bit of other people's situations here and there. Um, so now, basically, I'm going to go through what what you see and do in the game, and then after we go through that, I'll talk about how I went about creating it. Um, but this next, this next, uh, it's a video, basically going to show you just visuals only. And I recorded this, the game wasn't fully done at all, or uh, even early access, it was like months before this, but this is what it looked like before it was released, and I'll show you later. That, that's just kind of uh, what I used to help me make one of my trailers. So I'm going to show you around the game map and kind of the art, the art and the visuals. So a lot of, probably 90% of the assets that you see, um, I purchased those. Like through Unity and through other websites. Um, for me to be able to create all that, uh, it would have taken years, 10, 20 years to, to, to build the whole thing. It probably takes about 15 minutes or so to run through the whole map, um, which is pretty far considering a lot of the questing goes back and forth, up and down, treetop areas, underground cave systems. Um, this right here is showing, I used uh, an asset called Beautify. Um, I spent quite a bit of time on the Unity Asset Store, um, which, is, which was, I think, one of the major reasons why I liked Unity so much is that there's so much to use. Um, and getting the asset is the easy part, but making it work is, is a whole nother story. And then making it work with other assets is basically really the hardest part of creating a game. Um, it's just other visuals uh, in the game. Let's see art and design. So like the world is pretty expansive. I spent quite a bit of time creating the world. So every piece of the world is just out of my head, just totally custom. Um, and this is just a shot from 
inside the editor. I don't think you can see this from inside of the game uh, at all. Uh, a lot of layout design went into this, a lot of uh, looking at Pinterest and random places in the world to get ideas and creating. Um, I, my favorite part was basically building the world, and I spent quite a bit of time doing that. Uh, and a lot of the, a lot of updates came from people finding glitches, glitching the world, falling through the map, uh, random things like that that uh, you probably find ex maybe not that exciting when people try to break your game. Uh, but it is fun to see the interaction between users and the creator. So there's treetop area, like you saw in the video. Um, so one of these things, I'll tell you about this. So one of the main, well, well, well I'll tell you that. One of the major things was was lag. There was there was so much. It was so expansive. Um, the world is is one scene, um, and there's a, a variety of different ways to go about building the world that I found and. And I did find that not many people have experience with building open world games in general at all. So I was almost left hanging to figure it out by myself and to read as much as possible and to watch people's experiences and stories to really figure it out. Uh, there's also, so as well as a treetop area, there's also the middle level and then there's underground areas. Uh, underground cities, cave systems. Uh, there's these types of uh, what do you call it? Maybe like uh, um, platforms. Yeah, puzzles. yeah, puzzle type things like little things to do like this. You basically will kill them almost every time you try to go over here. I get killed almost every time I try to go there. It's towards the end of the game. It's actually pretty hard. <laughs> um, just underground cave systems again. Uh, climb up ladders. More caves. Um, more visuals, golden tablets. There's a helicopter that flies around, drops you off at the beginning of the game. Kind of cool. So as you travel throughout the world, uh, there's notifications that you'll find. You go and uh, you go into areas, and it'll notify you that you've discovered things, and it keeps track of where you go. Um, a lot of the areas, uh, when you get to a place where there's like something you can climb or interact with, it'll let you know and how to do it. At first I didn't have anything, I'm like, oh, the user will just figure it out. That was a bad idea. <laughs> uh, nobody knew what to do. I barely knew what to do. So you can climb the trees, you can scale them uh, upside down, you hang, you can also climb up, climb up almost all the vines in the game. Uh, just visual aspects. I spent a lot of time trying to make it look awesome, so I tried my best. I mean, I think it looks okay. It looks pretty good, I think. Uh, things like this in the game, just like different ideas for uh, scenery. So you can collect these treasures throughout the game. There's a whole bunch of those. Um, it's part of the storyline. So basically, you can collect treasures throughout the whole game, and there's a certain amount you have to collect, and it's part of a quest. Uh, you get at the beginning, um, you know, things like that. So most of the game is like this. You go interact with the person, you read, and you accept the mission, or you, this is the very first one, so you have to accept it. Um, you can also push escape, but we'll go into that. So I have a ragdoll system, when you, when you die, you basically flop all over the place. Like, I've never seen anyone die. I realized I wouldn't really know, but I just assumed that this is what happens. <laughs> Um, so when you're in the game, you push escape, so there's a pause menu, and you may find this interesting, is that, so I used, uh, Unity re released a, a template called Game Jam, you ever heard of it, anyone? Game Jam system, uh, anyway, it's free, you can download it, um, it doesn't look like this when you get it, it's super lame, uh, but you can adjust it, and it's actually extremely powerful. Um, you can use that, and basically, you plug it in, and We'll go into that in a minute, but it, it, it's very powerful uh, what you can get online for free. I mean, I, I didn't get everything free. I mean, I probably spent like $1,000 purchasing uh, different assets and things. 
Uh, we got resume. You can check your tasks. You can go and save. You can save your game. You can load your game. You can quit. Uh, adjust the settings. So when you click on tasks, um, it's like quests. Probably a flaw there. Game design, quests, and tasks, two different things, but they're basically the same. You can adjust them. Uh, you can see on the top right, there's a little red tag. It basically tells you what quest you're on. And then when you come here, you can read more about it for details. Uh, just another questing system. You can jump a lot. Okay, so major parts of the game. Uh, we're kind of going over this. Building the world, uh, player objectives, making things talk to each other was a major part. Loading and saving functions, which was a huge part of the game, uh, believe it or not, and play testing and optimization. So these were major parts. These things, these bullet points, were major parts of, of the game creation. Um, building the world was an extremely uh, Time intensive, but very fun, very fun part. Uh, when I got too tired of dealing with technicals, uh, like I spent six hours one time trying to get the guy to climb up a ladder, right? It's like uh, probably way too much time. And keep in mind, so this was the first time I had done these things, so for maybe someone else more experienced, they could figure it out maybe in like, way less time. Uh, but for me, I, I spent a considerable amount of time learning from the start. And uh, my motivation from all this was just, I just wanted to build something awesome, really. Uh, I woke up one day, discovered Unity, and, and just went for it. Um, the player objectives was a huge part, too, because without that, uh, it's super boring. I found out that uh, they need to be interesting. Um, and if you're comparing it to AAA titles, which is basically what everyone plays these days, uh, it, it's in a way competing against what people are used to. Um, and so that was a big thing. Making things talk to each other, I went over that for a second, but that was another major part of it, is that when you're, for me, um, I had very little coding experience in C Sharp, if any at all. I, I have a web background, so uh, it didn't really, wasn't the same thing at all. Uh, but after look, I mean, I wrote some scripts myself, used those, but uh, writing too much stuff was just so time consuming that, and there was tools to do it when I didn't have to. I'm like, well, why am I even writing anything? All I have to do is figure out how to make them work to, with each other. And so I think that's where I differ from a lot of other people is that uh, I was mainly focused on pushing, pushing as hard as possible in every, every area. So then I kept the momentum going. Because I know numerous times you get stuck on something and you just lose steam and you're like, oh, I'm tired of this and let's just move on to something else. Um, saving and loading functions were a huge part uh, because uh, the way I went about it is I have probably a hundred thousand or so objects in the one scene. Well, the game's actually three scenes, but the main the main game is one scene. Um, so there was so much lag when I first started. Like I didn't know what I was doing at the beginning, and I'm still learning. But at the beginning, I was just afraid that it wasn't going to work at all. Because I would get like 10 frames a second, and I was like afraid, really afraid. That I spent all this time, I spent like two months working on it every day for six hours a day, and maybe eight sometimes, maybe 10. And, I just didn't know what to do after that. Uh, but I'll go into that. Uh, play testing was another huge thing that took a lot of time. You gotta make sure everything works from the beginning. Um, we'll go into that too. And then optimization was another huge thing. So here's basically my layout, and you guys all have seen this before. It's basically a uh, you know, Unity system. So in the screen there, in the, the visual part, you can see there's these three people. Um, so my game is quest based, and so I had to basically play through each time I wanted to test it, and you've got, I think about 30 characters in my game, so I had to go from start to finish. If I want to test something at the very end of the game, it gets a lot more complicated, because then I have to make breaks in the middle, and then test it through, because if you start from the beginning to the end, every time you want to test like one little change, it's like, it takes forever. Um, but then the problem is sometimes if you if you change it at the end 
and you, so you could start there. I don't know, does that make sense? I don't know if, hopefully that makes sense somewhat. <laughs> it's harder to start mid-game when you have everything in one seat, right? Is yeah. that what you're saying? Yes, that's part, yeah, you could look at it like that. Um, so I use an asset called, uh, I think it's called Q Hierarchy. Basically allows you to, um, these three things on the side, you can like uh, hide objects, you can uh, block them and other things, these things here. Um, it's, it helped a ton, I think it was like $20. But things like that, the little assets, they speed things up so much um, and they make things faster. Um, and they also, this also allows you to mark items, mark objects, these like yellow things. You'll see like these white ones, like characters, um, and that speeds things up a lot. Because when you got like a hundred thousand objects and you organize it, it's just it gets out of control really, really fast. Especially when you're using, I got a, an asset called ZBrush, I think, and you can place like thousands of plants at one time. And you can also do it in Unity, but there's just different options that allow you to do it with these other assets. And without organizing it. Uh, it just gets out of control, like I said, really fast. Um, and when I first started, everything was, it was just, I put everything in the hierarchy, just plowed it down, nothing was grouped, and my system, my, my editor crashed so many times and it would freeze constantly. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to fix this, nobody was helping me, and I didn't know how to do it, right? So then I thought, you know what, let's just, I'm thinking of my web stuff, I'm like, okay, let's just organize it. Because I'm like, okay, let's organize all the files, let's put it all together. Um, and so I did, and it, it never froze again. Everything was working smoothly. It was kind of amazing. I don't know, that should be at the front of the user's manual um, in Unity. But, yeah, I don't know, maybe it was just obvious you should group things. Um, so, and this here, this is uh, an example of visual nodes I used for, I used uh, an asset called Dialog Systems. It enables you to create um, conversations between NPCs, or I used it for NPCs um, in the player. You got, uh, it comes with databases. Um, you can keep track of your actors, quests and your items. Uh, I didn't use locations, variables. All these things uh, make it possible to, to interact. Um, and I won't go through all the details of everything, but hopefully you can get the gist of kind of what I went through to do it. Um, th there's a lot more. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. If you're like, what does this mean? What does this mean? How'd you do this? Um, that would be just fine. And here we go, let's talk about this for a second. So, and this is a basic setup for Quest. So you got the text, like you come up to talk to someone, let's say you walk up and talk to someone. Um, this was the, probably the most important part, um, conditions. So basically, if you wanna come up and you talk to someone, if you're on a certain, a certain quest, um, it'll say do certain things. So like, it's, if this happens, then this happens. If this happens, then this happens. Um, and so everything is like that. Um, because there's so many quests, like if you went to the end of the game and you want to talk to someone, they'll say something when you talk to them. But if you're on a certain quest line and you talk to the same person again, they'll say something else. They're like, oh, I heard you were working on this, this quest, or I heard you have been here two weeks or something. Um, and that became fairly complicated uh, because you need to make sure everything works together in Minds Up. Um, plus, you need to make sure everything is typed specifically. But you probably know that since you do a lot of coding, if you put one thing in the wrong place, it gets all, everything is messed up. Uh, here's a little more of a, a complicated uh, <clears throat> conversation. So this is just, this is a NPC with only two quests. Um, and so there's so many arrows and options because let's say you, you, you go up to the guy, you accept two quests from this guy at the same time, and you go through and you finish one quest, um, but you don't want to turn in the other one, you have the option. And uh, so it needs to, there needs to be an option for every situation. Um, and that's what this is showing. That's why there's so many, this is the way I went about it. I have no idea if this is the correct way, but I know that this works really well. Um, probably because I don't know if, uh, any, I don't know if anyone has experience with this type of thing, but, but it works really well and it took forever. So I have a question. Sure. I've heard some people say that with open world games, if you have quests, and you said you're not fighting this game, but they'd have an example like 
if you happen to go to this place and kill a monster there, and then go somebody go somewhere else and they say, oh, go to this place and kill the monster, and you've already done it. So did you run into that kind of problem where I, things got out of sequence? Uh, uh, at the beginning, but I fixed it. <laughs> uh, that's where playtesting comes in. Like, you test so much stuff. Um, yes, there is. there are situations like that. Um, there is one quest where you can, I, I decide, decide that because there are some options where you can collect an item, but you're not on the quest yet. And I thought, well, should I show this item already? Should it just be sitting there? Like, is it real life? Should I just have this sword sitting here? Because it's not like it's just going to appear there when they get to the quest, although I did do a lot like that. Um, so it wouldn't enable the character to pick items up all throughout the map and then just accept the quest and be done with it. That's not as much fun because you're like, oh, what's this, what's this? But although I do have treasures around, and you can collect a few, uh, but eventually you will be on the quest for those items. Um, but I, the, the way I went about it is that when you accept the quest, the items appear. Um, for the most part. There are some where you can collect it, and then you'll get on the quest later. But it's mostly they, everything appears when you accept the quest. All right. So how long did it take you? I guess that's my, because I'm, I'm blown away that you did this all by yourself. Yeah. I kind of blown away too myself, but like, when I think about it, it hurts my I'm looking at it, I'm just like, holy cow. And you'll, you'll see when I go more into it, you'll be like, oh my gosh, what the heck, who is, what, what is going on here? Um, uh, yeah, I probably put over a thousand hours in for sure. Wow. A thousand hours. Over a thousand hours. Well over a thousand. Did you track your hours ever? Or was it just, um, you're just Not really, but I tried to figure parking. it out numerous times. Cause like, on, on average, I probably worked at least four hours a day, at least. Cool. Maybe two hours sometimes, but I remember sometimes it was like 10 hours, 12 hours. And why did I do it? Um, Inspired. I, I, to tell you the truth, um, I did web design and it was getting um, not as complicated, not too easy. And I guess my personality is I like a challenge, really, I do. Um, and this was a challenge, to say the least. And, and really, I think that was my motivation, is that I like a challenge. I mean, my personal life, like, um, I played piano for years. I did an Iron Man. Um, so I think whatever pushes me and challenges me, that's where I gain success. Um, so to answer your question, it took a long time. It looks like more than a thousand hours to me. Yeah, yeah probably. Thinking, maybe two hundred. Oh, quite a bit. I think in like three or four years. So you said you know an average of at least you know four and twelve hours a day for how long? How long? For um, to so let's see. In I started. I downloaded Unity. I think in March or February two thousand sixteen, and I released the game uh, about a year later. Yeah, uh, and I I thought the game was done about six months into it. Lo and behold, it was not even near done because I'm like, hey, it's done. Um, anyways, so, and you can keep asking questions, that's totally great. Uh, I use ZBrush, like these plants on this, like I made, built this, um, and there's other areas like this, this isn't the only one, it's just an example. It's like ZBrush enables you to, the asset enables you to just put plants. It's like how I did this, um, this building actually doesn't have colliders in it. No, well, some of them do, but I just put up a wall of a collider and just put the put the bushes over the top of it, um, and then I change it later. You can go inside because of that. Slept. There it goes again. I think it's working. All right. We'll see if that works. So I made a splash screen in its own scene um, that basically flies around and there's like electricity and stuff. I thought it was cool. Maybe it wasn't as cool as <laughs> at the beginning. Um, it just says Rakshin and then it goes on. Uh, so let's talk about the user interface. We kind of talked about this. Uh, there's a mini map in the top right. So basically, if you're walking around the map, um, when you get closer to an NPC, it'll have like a, a little exclamation mark. You, has any of you played World of Warcraft or like Skyrim, right? It's got the exclamation mark. If you're used to games and open world type of deal, it's a like question mark to turn it in, right? Um, so when you're done with the quest, it'll pop a question mark up, and when you, when you, when you complete it, it'll go away and play the sound and be like, hey, you did it, right? Um, 
And that was fun. And so after a while, uh, I realized that the things were too hard to find. It was like objects and things, you had to go find them. And so you can see up in the top right, I put these uh, little, see those blue, little blue dots? Uh, basically, it's like showing where the things are. Uh, because it was so hard to find things, I realized at first. Because for me, it's like easy. But then when people start playing it, and they're like, hey, we can't find anything, you start to change a lot. <clears throat> Just like, uh, here's the load screen. Okay, so here's the user interface, uh, it took some time. So I was just talking about the question mark there, you can see in the, and I just cut these and put these on. Um, you got the question mark, the exclamation mark, you got on the top there, we got the, the health bar, um, and it goes up and down, you can take fall damage, so when it gets down to the red, you, you die, react all death. Um, and I spent some time looking at uh, all different kinds of health bars, and I noticed there's so many varieties, and I came up with this one, just basic, simple, little Photoshop thing there. Uh, but it took some time to like come up with something I liked. Because it was lame at first, it was like just a little, little plus, and it was not very exciting. So then this map, I made all these things in Photoshop, then you get the little mouse cursor. When you push, so the mouse cursor doesn't show up unless you push escape. Um, which for the longest time I had the biggest problem. I couldn't get the mouse cursor to to show at the right times, and it was just this ongoing thorn in my side um, forever. And there was a lot of those actually. But this was one of the things that bothered me. And then finally I figured it out. Um, and it seems it seems so simple. Like it should just be so easy. Just push escape. The mouse cursor pops up. You push escape again. It goes away. It's simple, right? But the problem is there's so many different things interacting with so many different things that one of them overrides the other one, and the other, you know, there's so many different things happening. It's complicated, very complicated. Um, I probably had 40 or 50 assets just running all the time, you know, like doing things. Okay. Um, we were talking about forums, and I was calculating how many posts I did. So in four months' time, I posted over 300 times. That should give you an idea of what I was doing. And it wasn't just on the Unity forums, which by the way, the Unity forum was helpful, but I noticed there was a lot of developers that owned assets. They were selling their asset, but they would go on the forums to answer all these questions, and they want you to buy their asset. It worked pretty well, because I totally did it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoever's answering this, I want your support, so let's do it. Um, like Dialogue Systems, this guy named Tony was a major part in helping me, because he had this his AAA dialogue system uh, asset that was so amazing, it was only $60, and I was like, I'm buying this. And he helped me with his asset and support uh, quite a bit. Um, and that I used that dialogue system to do all sorts of things. It didn't just do conversations. Uh, I used it for triggers around the map, I used it for deactivating objects, activating objects as the player moved around to work on, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, to decrease lag, so uh, help me out. What's the word? Uh, performance. Performance. Uh, optimization. Optimization. <laughs> <laughs> right. Optimization was a huge part. So uh, that was a major part. Also, building characters was a major part. Uh, didn't take very much time. I used Fuse. It's actually on the Steam store. I think it was free at the time. I don't know, but I got about 20 or so characters, and this is just showing just some simple. I uh, use Mixamo for animations. Um, it did did pretty good, um, but there was a lot of bone structuring that had some real issues. It, it was complicated, to say the least, to try to make everything work. Um, getting it to work on the, the NPCs was a breeze, really. I just created an animated controller, hook up the animations, um, or if I had animals or something doing simple things. That was fairly simple. Um, but uh, making it work on my own character was, was a little bit more challenging because uh, I wanted it to look way better. It was a little more hard to do that. Then I won't go into the details of like creating those things. But I did create a few things, um, modeling like this. So I used Blender, also free. Um, but it's, it's very powerful tool. Um, you can hear, see it in game. Go past this. 
So optimization, um, I used occlusion culling, which basically, honestly, barely worked, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Sorry if anyone feels otherwise, but it just did not work uh, very well. It did work a little bit, but because everyone's like, oh, why don't you just use occlusion culling? At the time, I had no idea what that was. And I thought, oh, this is the answer to my prayers, right? Because I had so much lag, it's getting 10 frames per second. Um, and occlusion culling was the start of a new eye opener for me is that it really got me into the optimization world and how to go about it. Um, so this is the compiler, or sorry, the, uh, what do you call this, profiler. Um, you can see this is extremely bad. What happens up here is this, this green part is, uh, I believe, draw calls, and the other really isn't that important, but you're basically getting, uh, so I, I loaded this in here, what is it, 10, 17 frames a second, which is terrible, basically. Pretty bad. Um, it gets worse in some areas. But now it's like 60. Uh, 30 at the most released, it's like 30 at the lowest, maybe 25, and then at the best, like 60 or however big, big, uh, like good your graphics card is. So I was looking at this and I'm like, oh crud. After a while, I realized I didn't know how to fix this. Um, and the interest <coughs> here is basically you want to get this at 6.8 million, you want that to be like under a million. Um, at least I did. I thought under two was great. Most people would say they want it to be under 500,000, but I was happy if it was like below three, three million. Um, but I tried, and, and what that means is um, if your character is looking in a certain area, you got this view. Um, and then it basically draws everything, it, it puts everything in, it's, it's rendering everything. Well, in this case, here, let's go to the next one. Um, so you can see the red arrow over here uh, is drawing like 50%, 51%. So basically that was, it, it's basically, how do I put this? You guys know what I'm talking about? Maybe, oh, let me explain it a little bit. Um, it's basically <laughs> like putting everything in one area, like drawing everything, like seeing everything at once. If there's too many things, it's gonna lag. So you gotta decrease them or mesh them together or use occlusion culling to recreate basically everything in front of you um, to make it work. And I had to redo a ton of stuff because it was just lagging. Um, and most of that's like through game design. So then what I did was I created a lot of choke points through the game. Um, what that means is basically there's triggers. You go around the map, you'll run through it. A cave, you, you have to run through it. How's the camera doing? Seems good so far. You gotta run through these areas so it'll deactivate what's behind you turn it all off, and then turn on the new stuff in front of you. Um, it, that's the way I did it. I tried other things, but they didn't work the way I wanted. I didn't have the control, and I didn't have time. Mostly it was time to sit there and spend another month or two just like figuring it out. I needed to figure out exactly what worked the best for me, what I knew how to do, and just do that. Um, to push, like I said, keep the momentum going. That was the most important thing, is keep the momentum going. Go ahead. If you could remake the game, would you do the areas in separate scenes, or would you do occlusion calling again? Well, I would do occlusion calling for sure, um, every time. Uh, would I make it in separate scenes? Um, actually, at first, I tried to make everything a separate scene. I had like seven scenes. Um, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't get it to work how I wanted. I would try to like teleport. I'm like, OK, to do that, you got to like teleport your person to a certain place, and you like, had to get them up here. And then, and then the save and load function thing, that was the biggest part. It's like, well, how do I? trying to figure out what to save, and like save the new scene, and I was like, this is so much more complicated than I want it to be. Um, so I thought, let's just put it all in one huge scene, because that's the easiest for me, and then just deactivate everything, and then put save triggers on all the areas. So you go through an area, and it sells, tells, it tells the game, hey, this is now saving, or uh, you know, like if you save the game, it now knows where you are, because you went through the trigger, it tells the game. And so that way, you go around everywhere you go, it's basically logged where you are in the game. Um, does that make sense? And that's the way I went about it. Go. I, they might not have had this feature because I don't remember when it came out, but uh, they have like multi scene load now in Unity where you can have, like if you had, you know, four quadrants to your thing, you can save each quadrant as a different scene, but then you can load any number of those scenes at the same time, and they're kind of like cells, if you will. And yeah. I don't know if that was available when you started or when you um, were because I think yeah. that is relatively new. It probably was, but yeah, like I, I said a second ago, is that I needed to do the 
the easiest way possible and that I knew how to do so I could just push for as, as quickly as possible. So learning something else like that, um, like trying to figure it out was just a whole other project by itself. No argument. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't used the profiler before, it basically tells you a lot of stuff, where you, what you need to fix. So it's like adjustments, like there was one area, um, all these little rocks in this gun area, where like I thought it was so awesome, I put like 20,000 rocks down, like it's the coolest thing ever, it looked awesome, but it lags, like 30 frames per second less. And I'm like, well, I can't, I can't do this, so I take them out, right? Things like that. Um, butterflies, I had this vision of like thousands of butterflies flying around, I thought it was gonna be the coolest thing ever, you go down to South America and you see these things in National Geographic, you're like, this is awesome. But I did it, and it was like so laggy, and like I, I just can't do it. Um, and, and I had to make decisions like that, where it's like I want it to be like this, but you can't sacrifice performance because you get in there, it's gonna be a terrible experience for everyone. Um, like Mesh Baker is a, an asset you can get that meshes things together. Um, but because I had a hundred thousand objects in my scene, I was like, wow, I can't mesh all these. It'll take so long, too way too long, and plus it wasn't organized. When I was doing this, I was like, "There's no way I can do that." I did buy it; it was like sixty dollars or something, or a hundred. I can't remember, but um, it was an answer. But I just went about it a different way. Um, like audio lag glitches. Uh, I remember one time I was I loaded an audio in the scene. I have no idea why I did this. Maybe it wasn't a glitch. I don't know. Um, it's just like created a lot of lag, and I didn't know that's what it was. But I had to go through and like load a backup that I had. I'm like, okay, this backup doesn't lag at all. This other one. This new one run uh, totally lagged. What's the difference? I do that so many times. Uh, I can't tell you how important it is to have a backup. It's so so important. If I didn't back, I probably made a hundred over a hundred backups. Um, I hated losing stuff. Um, like I didn't want to. I didn't want to like redo anything. Um, too many bushes and plants again. Lag like water lag. The, the default Unity. Water looks awesome, but it just lagged for some reason in my scene. Maybe it was interacting a certain way, so I used Aqua Light. Five bucks, done. It's like perfect. Put water all over the place. It was amazing. Um, same thing with particle lag, uh, like torches and little leaves or snow or, or things like that flying around or birds or not birds, <coughs> like particles. But those that lag a lot of times, you got to deactivate those and activate them when you need them. Um, techniques I used for optimization. Um, here we go, we'll talk about this. So we have that treetop area. You can like go up in the trees and there's like birds. So I actually deactivated everything on the ground. And that's kind of the way my whole game is, that you deactivate things you can't see, and I just put treetop over the top. So you can see down, and if you fell, you would just die. So you can't really get down there in other ways. Um, and that's just like a game design choice that uh, I just put trees, so you can look down and you see trees, and then there's just, there's nothing there. So there's hardly any objects in the scene, but it looks great because you're above the trees. Um, trigger is choke points, we talked about those, redesign terrain. Um, talk about that, so play testing, I did this a lot where I would like type. I would like take a screenshot, load it, put it in Photoshop, and then I would type where I was. Because there were so many things, uh, I would come back the next day and wonder where I left off. I did this all the time. Uh, literally, like I would type, I would type in my Microsoft Word or something. Hey, this is what I, where I left off. Because if I didn't, I'd be, I, it would, I wouldn't remember anything. There was like thousands of things to do, like thousands of things. Um, anyway, so I did stuff like this. I'm like, hey, I'm on this quest. This this is happening. Whatever. Um, and I, I talked to a lot of people about how you go about playtesting, and the answer was it just depends on your game, uh, because every game is different. And so I had to just decide for myself how I wanted to do it. So I'd line up like 30 characters in a row, like two feet from each other. So I would like accept the quest, go to the next one, accept the quest. And I would like took like one item that you need to collect right here and just mark it as like complete when I collected the item. Um, and then I just went through. That's the way I did it for a while. And it was took forever. Go ahead. How many other people did you have play test? Um, like two people I had play test before I released it. Um, but that's about it. Is that at all when you thought you were done six months ahead when you actually were done? Like, in yeah. my experience, 
the developer can't break it nearly as much as somebody who wants to oh, actually break it. Oh, yes, totally true. Yeah. That's definitely true. Although I did my best at trying to do that, but I'll tell you an example that I'm not really proud of, but I'll tell you anyway because it will help your experience. Is that so? When I released it, there was a guy on YouTube that had like half a million subscribers, <laughs> and he's like, "Hey, let's review this guy's game, right?" Like, just came out, early access, there's glitches, right? Okay. So they basically made fun of it the whole time. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. It's, like, really hard. Uh, but, you know, I actually did a lot of game stuff before I did game development. I had, like, a YouTube channel with gaming stuff, and I know it's ruthless. And so I was, I'm was. i glad I was already, like, ripped up a little bit before I got there. Um, but they, they like fell through the map like 20 minutes into it, and I was like, oh, dude, I thought this would never happen. I thought I'd fix this. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's hard because you get like 100,000 people watching them break your game, and everyone's like, oh, it's not, it's not ready to be released. And, you know, whatever. It goes on forever. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so group testing, feedback. Feedback is the hardest part, but it's also the most important part. Uh, I put my game up on the internet, I'm like, hey, give me your feedback, let me know what you think. Um, it's like testing, I got a YouTube channel, people are you know, constantly giving feedback. You know, everything from this game looks awesome, to you have no idea what you're doing, to <laughs> both sides. Um, Steam is probably the best place, uh, because that's your target, those, those people bought it. And they're like, here's what we want to see. Here's what we want to see in updates. Um, just backups again real quick, though. So I had two drives, well, multiple drives, but I loaded the game on the SSD. So if you don't load your game on a solid state, you just get it. It's just, I would never recommend doing it without this. Um, especially, maybe if you have a simple game, it doesn't matter. But when there's so much to load, it'll just take forever. So I definitely recommend definitely using a solid state. Um, fun, I kept uh, multiple backups in different areas because you work on it for a thousand hours. I'm not going to let it go to waste if my hard drive dies. That's for sure. So I, I'll buy a thumb drive and I'll put it on there. I'll put it on like I'll try to upload parts of it to like a cloud or something. But the game, this the edit edit version was at the end was like 30 gigabytes. It's pretty big. Um, and when I started, you know, it was like one or less, less than one. So uh, the amount of space you need is uh, pretty substantial when you got to make a backup of 20 gigabytes every time. And I had over 100, so I got a four terabyte drive that I'm loading on these, these backups too. Um, this was another part. So if you uh, see this screen, you better make darn sure you've... Uh, back your system up because I know from experience that I've tried, I'm like, whatever, the screen, just don't even read it, just click whatever comes along. And I actually did that multiple times. Um, but I, when you load an asset or you change something, a script, even one script, um, actually I don't know if it does one script, but, but if you load new stuff on here, you get this screen, it's like, hey, make sure you did a backup because I've loaded on assets that like one time it created this black flicker across the entire map and I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? I, I don't know how to fix it. So I'm like going around through hours and hours and hours and hours like trying to figure it out. And it happened to be this, this asset and it was just one little stick. Like a little stick, you stick in the ground, it was causing this major problem across the entire map. I don't know what the deal was, but this one stick, so I deleted it or took it out and it fixed the whole thing. Um, and I did that by, I loaded the two backups, like I had a backup with no problems and then the new new version with the loaded in assets with the problems. So I like compare both. I did that a lot, like when there was a problem. And then I learned to never do that again, so I always made a backup, um, because if you can't compare, you got serious problems, like big problems. Um, audio, so there's supposed to be a little sound playing, but I think I messed it up. Maybe if I click this, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so audio, I did things like this. Uh, splash screen, menu, menu sounds, you got footstep sounds, uh, door creaking or grinding, you got breaking things. Um, so audio for all these things. Uh, let's see, where's the one I wanna tell you? So like even water, like water, I got this fountain in place. So I went in my bathtub to put my cell phone next to the thing 
And it's like water sounds like boom, 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 boom. And then I loaded it into my game. It's awesome. It worked. It totally worked. Like it sounds great. Um, and like uh, like for example, you got this door. I have a, a big gate that opens up for one of the quests. Like you put in a password to someone and then they open the gate for you. So I went outside, I have my cell phone, I drag a pot on the ground. Instead of paying five, ten bucks online, it like took me 20 seconds to make a sound. Um, just like simple things that I did. And you don't need to pay a lot of money for stuff like that, you could just do it yourself. And a lot of these artists or guys on, on uh, these assets that you, you can buy, you can buy sounds with like huge libraries. Um, and I did buy some sounds, but but this, like the custom stuff, you just got to do it yourself. Um, so here's organization. Uh, let's just go through this. So 3D models. Um, stand on this side. So this was the folders on my desktop. Uh, it's where I put my models. You got all the games I built. So I'll do like a build, and I'll do testing what it actually looks like. That was like a lot of fun. Um, I got an asset folder, all my audio, all my backups, like hundreds of gigabytes in there. Um, behavior tree design project. So I, originally I wanted to put uh, AI system with like enemies and other things and guys walking around. That was the original idea, but that slowly went away when it was just so much work to just get the game going and then to add another like whole interactive, like shoot 'em up style was like a whole nother thing. So I decided to scrap that. Got a character folders, um, music, and I like I got licenses from people to be able to use it in their game. And I was actually surprised a lot of times that uh, as far as Unity is concerned, they basically give you, uh, they're like, hey, you can use this in your game. I thought that was so amazing because anywhere else in the world, it seems like you want to use an image or somewhere, you got to like pay and you got to pay extra. And it was just like this extra project to get licenses. But through uh, game development, it's like flawless, it seems like. A lot of graphic design, dialogues. Um, it's so like I wrote out like lots of dialogues for all the NPC quests. How long it took me to go from certain area to certain area, so it wasn't uh, I could just work on quests that weren't way too long or way too hard. I wanted people to have a better experience going through. I was gonna say maybe just like ten more minutes. Okay. Is that cool? Yeah. Is that enough time for you? Yeah. Is that is that how are we on time? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, anyway, but you can see the rest, and then these things at the bottom. It's basically images I made, uh, you can see them in the game, like in the editor. Uh, so you, like a trigger, for example, you can load it into a collider um, so you know that it's there. Because if you're looking at it in the game, there's nothing. But if you load one of these things, you can click on it and see that there's a collider there. Like a trigger, um, like S, like save, actually stop using the save function, but like a music area, um, collider for C. I made all these custom, so it would help me like organize everything. Um, just like an example of a collider there, you can see like the collider, like the green outline and then the T uh, with the trigger. It's basically you run through it and you can basically make anything you want happen. Um, organization, so I actually ended, I drew out a lot of these things, like certain areas um, that would be activated and deactivated and how the player would interact through the map. Um, just like drawings that I do to organize it. And then even with game world creation, like I'll draw, I drew it out. So this is the product of this. There's like a spiral staircase on the inside. Kind of cool. And I got a suggestion from someone to just write it on a notepaper. I'm a real digital guy. I actually don't like writing anything on paper. Um, but they said this worked for them. And it surprisingly was pretty awesome. Because I didn't know where to really start, and so I just, this is kind of my quest line, characters. I just basically wrote out a bunch of stuff. Uh, this is kind of after I wrote it out. This is the, uh, let's see if this plays. It's supposed to be like an animated, well, anyway. I just basically wrote it out on computer afterwards. Um, so like marketing, once you finish the game, it's like a whole nother area of world after that, you gotta market it now. It's like a whole nother, it's like another game basically. Yep. <laughs> Second job, your third job. 
Yeah, really, really is. Um, so there's marketing. Um, I was on the Unary website. You can type it. They've actually changed that now. I think you can't even look at look for those games anymore or something like that. Uh, I built my website, uh, my YouTube channel, branded it, Ruction, made a bunch of videos. You can go and look at them. Um, I think my best video had like 60,000 views or something like that. Um, you got IndieDB, basically kind of wordless, although that was one of the first things I did. I started marketing it like maybe three months into it, uh, just so people could like follow my progress. So here's something you might be interested in. Um, so Greenlight, at the time, they had Greenlight going, now it's like Steam Direct, which honestly is basically the same thing, you just don't vote, I think. Uh, here's my stats. So when I first started, what this is, is day one. Just look here, day one, two, three, all the way up to day nine. So I got greenlit, if you're familiar with the process, basically people vote on Steam. I released it on Steam, they can vote if they want your game or not. Basically if they will buy it or not. But it's not really buy it because people don't really gonna buy it. They're just like, yeah, it's cool, done. Uh, so 57%, I think it is, said that they would buy it. 41% said no. Um, at about 2,000 games, it finished uh, like rank 35 or something. It says 41 there, but that was like they deleted the stats afterwards. But I kept track of them every every few, every day. It looks like. And nice. is, sorry, can I ask when you started your green light campaign? Was it like? Yeah. Um, so I read online again. I was looking at when, what's the best time? When did people do it? When do you when do you do it? Um, yeah, I started. I re I started it like months before I was even ready to go. But as soon as I had a trailer, like something to show, as soon as I had like a, some kind of gameplay, then I threw it up on Greenlight. Uh, but without like a cool, like a trailer or something that people were like yes or no to, can't really do anything. Um, yep. So, and I realize you might not be able to, be able to answer these. Seems your only publisher. You didn't have another publishing partner or of any kind. Is that right. Sure? I chose that, by the way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, not a bad decision. So, uh, did you feel like I, honestly I haven't done anything like this park support for publishers? Um, and, you know, anyway, uh, did you have to sort of agree to terms with Steam? Are they fairly standard? Like, did you have to like negotiate anything, or did you have to, did you know how to sort of navigate that process? Or sure, can you talk about that at all? Um, there was no negotiation. Basically, it was like agree to this or don't do it at all. Okay. Um, and the green light is actually different than releasing on Steam, because you could put it, I know there was a guy I talked to, he had his game up on Steam for over a year, it's just sitting there. So my game got greenlit in like two weeks, well, 17 days I think, about 17 days. Um, but the, it's pretty extensive, basically like a real contract with a real company. Um, like I, one of the major things is you agree that you won't tell people how many sales you made, um, just things like that. Just like simple things like that. But I actually hired a couple guys to do some marketing for me on Steam. Um, like you can see the jump, see these unique users, 944, 1200, 1300, and then a big bounce in one day. Like 6,000 people to uh, 13,000. So I hired these guys in Dubai actually to do some marketing for me uh, on Steam. Basically, uh, Steam marketing on Steam was the best and got the best results, by far. I tried marketing on YouTube, I got like hundreds of thousands of you know, views on my YouTube stuff, but it like converted to zero. It, it was just zero conversion. Like I thought. The presentation is about 30 minutes longer, but I'm just gonna throw in a few extra slides and just real quick talk about them. So the game was released on Steam um, and I'm glad it happened. You're going to have to do a lot of updates after the game's done if it's early access. Stay motivated was a huge factor in finishing this thing. I used dialogue systems. It was a major part of my game. Uh, it's got a cool fold-out map in the middle. You saw it in the video. And I made uh, a lot of the textures myself. So hopefully that helped you guys. And Maybe I'll put some more information out about this. Uh, leave a comment below. Subscribe if you want to see more. And I'm here to help. All right. Thanks, guys. See ya.